The following podcast contains quite a bit of explicit and slightly fruity language. If you're listening to this somewhere where you have young children, you might want to pop in your headphones. Now, on with the show. If you can't um, laugh at yourself, then you're never going to see the flaws. It's the flaws that are funny. The good bits aren't funny, particularly. The good bits are great bits you need to cherish and look after. But the flaws are what makes you makes you a human being. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humor. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a multi-award winning songwriter, performer, humorist and quite frankly, national treasure. For over 40 years, she's been delighting audiences around the world with her mellifluous musical melodies, coupled with laugh out loud lacerating lyrics. She's a founder member of the fabulously funny, fascinating Aida and they regularly pack theatres around the globe and also rack up tens of millions of YouTube views. Her tremendous talent is to create the classic comedy combination of wild, wicked and wonderful songs that somehow managed to make even the meekest of maiden aunts laugh at the riskiest of risque ribaldry. Dilly Keen, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I I said all that because I mean it and we've worked together in the past and you've been making uh, me laugh for many, many years. Was the young Dilly Keen fascinated by comedy and music? Yes, I was. And I think it comes um, uh, through the family from my grandmother. Apparently she could do a, a part, she had an extraordinary party trick she would tuck her violin underneath her chin and say, right, who's this? And she would play a sort of little figure of music and people would go, (laughs) it's the bank manager. Um, So she could do that with music. Um, And I've always been fascinated with music that suits funny lyrics. But I also get the love of words from my father. Um, as, As a child, I was very sick. Uh, for long, long periods of time, I was in hospital in and out, and I was out, stuck in my bedroom at home at the top of the quite a tall house, uh, not allowed to get out of bed because you weren't encouraged to get out of bed when you were sick in those days. It's a long time ago. Yeah. And uh, so uh, my mother put the, the family, as we used to call it, gramophone, uh, and they had a very large collection of Gilbert and Sullivan, and I just played through the Gilbert and Sullivan repertoire. And mum got me the uh, the uh, libretti. And so I studied them and I had a dictionary and I used to look up the name, what the words meant. So I, I knew what trepanning was when I was about 10. Well, which is an important word for comedy, basically. Uh, well, it was for Gilbert. <laughs> I've never used it yet. There's a, an NHS song waiting to happen. That we're going back to trepanning. <laughs> So t- tell me more about that obsession as a, a childhood. I mean, it, it sounds like it was through necessity because you, you, you needed something to keep yourself or your spirits up during those years. What, what, why was it so obsessive, really, I suppose? I'm not sure that it was obsessive. I mean, I don't, don't look back at myself and think, Cheap as I was an obsessive child, I just think it was it was there, and it was it was one of the ways that the days wild by, and because I was very musical, I could play the stuff, um, and the tunes are infectiously charming, and um, and the rhyming and the structure of, of Gilbert's language is impeccable, and so it just it beguiled me rather than obsessed me. Okay, um, that's, and I that's... still I still return to it when I'm. 
a bit down in the dumps, um, I listened to Gilbert Sullivan. Oh, really? So it, it's still uh, the through line through your life is, is Absolutely. Gilbert? Absolutely. It is the, the ultimate through line. I, uh, or when I'm incredibly busy and I need real, a huge amount of energy. Um, for instance, when um, um, I had, my, my partner was, a, was 70, uh, we decided to have a party and I asked him what the budget was and I said, well, that means I'm doing the catering then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, he, so, so I had a week to prepare food for a hundred people, and I listened nonstop to Gilbert Sullivan, and I just whizzed myself through it. So, uh, well, it's a, it sounds fantastic. It's tonic, it's my tonic. Oh, there, that's a, that, that's nice. A tonic for the troops. What apart from Gilbert Sullivan, what makes you laugh? Well, um, uh, surprise. Surprise makes me laugh. So uh, if, if if a lyric comes along that's surprising, it usually makes me laugh. Um, it's not it, what, what the unexpected makes me laugh. Um, uh, I like wit. I like clever humour. Um, but I also, uh, you know, I am a sucker for dumb and dumber. Um, so I, I, I love, it, you know, falling over and things like that. You know, it's very hard to explain to somebody what makes you laugh because it can be so many different things. And it can also, um, uh, you know, when people attempt to make you laugh or something's sort of supposed to be funny on television, you sit there going, oh my goodness, why do people find this funny? I, I never found Cannon and Ball funny. I never found Little and Large funny, but I still, you know, cry with Martha to Malcolm and Wise. So it is just, a, it's a personal it's taste, taste thing. Isn't it? And is there, is there anything that is in the modern realm that you suddenly go, okay, that's, that's really funny or is, is everything sort of... Well, put it this way, if Gavin and Stacey have a Christmas special, <laughs> yeah. you know, do not disturb Dilly Keen. And, uh, <laughs> Um, you know, just with my face, you know, already like this, you know, smiling ear to ear and my cheeks all tight with excitement because it's Gavin and Stacey. Um, I absolutely love it. Outnumbered, I think, is as witty as uh, as can be. Um, I love watching Flo and Joan. I think they're, they're, I'm thrilled with what they're doing. Well, that's interesting because that's uh, that's musical comedy as well. And, yes, very much so. And I'm, I, 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 you know, I, I like to fancy in my imaginings of, of, of sort of absurd grandeur that I've, I'm passing the flame on that they're taking out the torch on. But they're very good. They're very clever. I admire them hugely, and I'm thrilled with what they're doing. Well, we've both got a, a background in musical comedy. Why, why do you think music and comedy works so well and cuts through so well? Um, what, what makes it different? Well, you can listen to a funny song again and again, and you can't listen to a joke again and again. Um, and music it gives it endurance. Um, and the other thing about it is that uh, uh, people will often get it wrong and they come back to the show and they go, oh, that's why it was funny. Uh, you know, for instance, um, uh, we have a song. How rude can I be on this? Uh, Absolutely. Book? Anything you like on this. We have a song, uh, a Christmas song now, which is about five years old. It's gone a bit bonkers on the internet. And people say to me, I do love your song. Don't be a, <laughs> a for Christmas. And I say, it's not. It's try not to be a <laughs> It's Christmas. <laughs> One is an order that can't possibly be fulfilled. And the other is a, a plea. And that's much funnier. <laughs> Uh, because it, the assumption is that it's um, is that whoever you're talking to is, without any shadow of a doubt, going to be a. But, but could you and is generally all year. But just try not to be. It's Christmas. Try, try, please. And it's much funny. So when people come back and hear the correct lyrics, and uh, they still go away um, singing, "I love that song." Don't be a for Christmas. They get it wrong because they haven't got musical brains, but it's much funnier in reality. And so I think, I think humor, if you get humor in song right, it, it stands the test of time much better than a joke. Absolutely, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And by the way, all our listeners, um, we're, we're, we're coming up to Christmas and uh, whatever time of year, look up that song, it is hilarious. 
and 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 also it's very precise as you say and i i love that whole idea that it, it's so precise i love the jerry seinfeld quote which is um comedy is the closest thing to justice if you're funny you survive if you're not you don't do you think that's true I don't know what context he means it in. It sounds terribly deep, but I, I, I have no idea. I know some people who aren't funny at all, uh, and they survive fine. Oh, no, I think I mean, he's talking the, about I, in he, terms of performance, actually. Oh, I think okay, it's the okay. ultimate, it's looking, the ultimate Roman... Boris Johnson, who is funny and is capable of being very, very amusing. And... Um, uh, is is in many ways sort of surviving and yet not surviving. Yeah, no, I I think that uh, that Jerry Seinfeld's talking about that whole sort of um, Roman amphith amphitheater thing about you survive or you don't survive, in, uh, based on and it's very clear you either yeah. make them laugh doing, or you don't. If you're doing Pinter, yeah, yeah, or if you're doing, I mean, I think. You know, I, I think Chekhov is always better performed by people with an innate uh, funny bone here or there, um, and and Pinter too, but in, in many ways. But uh, there are an awful lot of performances that don't require you to be funny, and there are very good, very unfunny performers who have great depth. Well, Dad, talking about funny, tell me a funny story about something that's happened to you in in your illustrious life. Um, actually. Uh, I, I have been mercifully blessed with a sort of fairly straightforward career. And the, um, I mean, the funniest thing that's ever happened was one of those moments you can't really explain it. It was, um, I was on stage and I had put on a tiny bit of weight and my rather skin tight dress sort of went <coughs> and split down the side. And um, I, I was, it was fascinating going to, and uh, uh, Marilyn Cutts was in the group then, and she came over to the piano. Luckily, it had split upstage as opposed to downstage, which meant the audience was, I was seated at the piano. It was my left scene. And I said to Marilyn, I went, Marilyn, my, my dress was split. And she went, yes. <laughs> my dress was split. She went, yes. I walked off stage. <laughs> so I had to get up. And luckily, I had a jacket. Um, and uh, which I'd taken off, and um, uh, I, 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 I lifted up the jacket and explained what had happened to the audience. I said, I'm terribly sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I have to sidle off stage now because my dress is split. It's not that funny, but there we are. It was funny at the time, he had to be there. Actually, that's one of the things that, as a performer and somebody who's performed uh, at the highest level for so many years, isn't it? Uh, about owning that that thing and telling the audience what's happened rather than sidling away. That's the cabaret. I mean, obviously, there are songs where you don't want it to happen because we have a, a fairly kind of a strong tradition now of of, uh, of dipping into seriousness um, at least once during the show when you don't want the microphones to crackle or you don't want some, someone to shout, get them off you! <laughs> uh, from the audience um, or anything. Not that they have for a while. That's the great thing about you being older. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they, they, they're, they're loving the serious side because I actually I, I, I've listened to a lot of your son and there's the, the bathos of, of, of some of the songs is beautiful. And I was just um, uh, listening to Song for Tom the other day and uh, I advise listeners and to, to actually catch that because it's one of the most it is funny but it's in a such a sweet loving touching way that it really transports the thing is this something because you, you truth humor and truth are very very closely aligned is this something that you I've come more to in later years, or is it always no, been there? Song for Tom was quite an old song. Song for Tom is about 25 years. I mean, uh, I, I don't know what the first really, really good true song. No, I wrote a song years and years and years and years ago called Saturday Night, um, which is actually still a lovely song about sitting on your own when everybody else seems to be out partying on a Saturday night and thinking, 
oh, what do I do next? And it's got a couple of really good, funny lines in it. Yeah, no, it's always been there, that sort of, as you say, that sort of somewhere between pathos and bathos, the the absurdity of the human condition fascinates me. And Song for Tom is a lovely song because it's it's about the inability to uh, to allow yourself to fall in love, to let yourself be vulnerable. Dad. And um, I think that's uh, that's worth um, exploring in song. No, and I, I think you explore it so well. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the song. It's about uh, dating a married man. Oh, he, much more married. Much more married, uh, yeah. which is uh, another of my favourites. Um, do you remember but, Dan Crawford? Um, do I remember? Who ran the King's uh, Head Theatre. Oh, yes. I remember when I sang that first. Uh, it's a very old song, that. I sang at the Piccadilly Theatre. When it would have been in the in about 1987. Yes. I wrote that. And um, I, <laughs> Dan came up to me and said, Very, very good song. Very, the best satirical song I have ever heard. Oh. <laughs> Which from Dan was, was very, very pleasing because I loved oh. it. Well, thrilling because he really knew his stuff and he'd seen most everything. It was a bit of an exaggeration, but I, I've cherished the memory. No, I don't think it is an exaggeration. I think that for you, does humour and truth have to touch to make the song really work? No. Uh, it depends what song you're writing. Now, for the listening millions, um, Much More Married is a song that was actually happened because of uh, because of something that happened in my life i uh started dating a man who um uh and i was in my early 40s so sort of it's that you don't know who you know you, you meet somebody and you fancy them you don't really know much about their background and you wonder why they're on their own well every time i met him he was just there was just something slightly more compromised about his situation the first time I met him he was on the on the verge of um, finalizing divorce second time I met him he was on the verge of um, instructing his divorce lawyer third time I met him um, uh, he, he was separated and the fourth time I met him he was actually living in the same house as his wife but separated um, uh, living in a different wing I mean what was it Buckingham Palace um, and so uh, I stopped um, seeing him, I just stopped answering the phone because I thought, I can't be bothered with this. Because I, I wouldn't want, you know, much as he was fun and everything, I wouldn't want some woman to do that to me. He, quite clearly, he was a lying toe rag. Anyway, about six months later, the phone went. And um, it was him. And I, woke, uh, I answered around, oh, hello. He said, hello, I've been trying to get hold of you. I've left lots of messages, but I you know, haven't heard from you. And I said, yes. Yes. Oh, right. Right. Oh, I probably didn't I'm not, didn't get the maybe. Uh, and uh, I've always found an imaginary secretary is great. I think my secretary must have left me a note or to maybe forgot. I have no secretary, don't be silly. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, he eventually said, um, um, would you like, like to come for dinner? And I went, oh, Mm, no, I don't think so. Thank you. But no. He said, well, how about lunch? And I said, no, no, I don't think so either. And he said, why? I said, because every time I met you, you were a little bit more married than you said. Uh, Ting! There's... Long! It, in my head, I was, oh, that's a song. And uh, anyway, it, the conversation finished. And he said, oh, I didn't think you cared about that sort of thing. And I said, I don't. And that was the end of the phone call. Um, and it was very pleasing because you very, very rarely get closure on anything in life. And that was closure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that's where that song comes from. Um, uh, obviously, it's, you know, uh, when I wrote, when, when you listen to the lyrics of the song, uh, the, 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 the imaginary relationship in the song, it goes a lot further than I did with the man, the Irishman whose name I've now forgotten. Um, and um, uh, he uh, and uh, you know the me in the song is obviously much more involved and 
uh, it ends up with finding out that the wife is actually pregnant. But it comes from that point of absolute truth. Yes, that's what happened to me. And I'm, I've just written a song um, about uh, the sort of situation for me it, it, during COVID, which again was one of those moments you go, ping, I've just said a title of a song. Um, I was in a shop. Uh, this man was taking quite a long time. It was a very small shop and I was just, so I was waiting for him. You know, we were in masks too. And he would turn around and said, I'm so sorry I'm taking so long. I said, it's all right, don't worry. I've got nothing to do. And all day to do it in blues. Mm. Yeah. That's a song. Ping However, again. you then write a song. Um, like for instance, um, there was all that, uh, there was quite a craze a few years ago of a, a very um, famous Hollywood um, A-listers um, having surrogate babies. Um, and we wrote a song uh, called, uh, about uh, uh, an, orang an orangutan having my baby. <laughs> well, that's clearly not possible, but it comes from a kind of grain of truth that people recognized. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, the song, another song, for instance, Mother, Dear Mother, uh, is a song about, you know, taking your mother to to, um, uh, to Switzerland to uh, Dignitas. And, and that doesn't come from any truth at all, but it comes because Dignitas is there. There's an element of, you know, people recognise a, a, a horrible possibility, but that doesn't come from any, any kind of truth in my life or anyone that I know. No, but you 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 take sort of um, ideas as well, yeah. which are yeah. uh, uh, in in the collective consciousness as well. Um, you said earlier on that that you've had some people who you were definitely not funny, you know. And the, because I was going to ask, is everyone funny? But what I'm going to ask now is, can talk comedy be taught in any sphere or realm? No. You think no, it's... it's like musicianship? It's just you've got it, or it's like a, uh, you know, a gift for gardening, or um, or an ability to ride a horse, you know, or uh, it, you know, it, we have, you know, uh, attributes as human beings which are different from from person to person, and uh, some people are funny and some people are very funny, some people are not funny at all. But but these traits can be developed, can't they? If you have a, a, a core of funny, you can develop that because you've been doing it all your life and hopefully I've been doing it as well. You develop um, that core. But because uh, I'm with you that the core is there, that you either hear the beats or you don't. Uh, yeah, I don't think I'm funnier now than I was 40 years ago. I, am, I, I can understand it now. I can analyse it now, but I'm not funnier I haven't improved. So you don't what think... What I've got is I've got a sort of an assurance on stage, I think, probably, that I didn't have then, but I go and less, maybe. <laughs> the audience might not tell me that. Um, um, I'll, I'll go and less in pursuit of a laugh. I'll, I'll let laughs go, and that's experience. Um, and I'll, I'll mom I know moments when not to get a laugh. Uh, I think that's experience as well. But no, I'm not funnier. I mean, I walked on stage at university and then, and everyone you said you have funny bones, and I didn't understand what that was. But I knew I was funny because I'd been funny at school. I was very, very funny as Rainbow the Janitor in The Happiest Days of Your Life. I gave a, a superb performance of a grizzled beard. Uh, yes, I brought the house down. Well, no, I was funny. I was always no, funny. And so that inherent hearing the funny and, and knowing instinctively. Is yeah. you, you think that so? I mean, this is a podcast which is for everyone, but but also for people in business. I I when I train people, I I'm I'm always they go. I've got to start with a joke, and if they're inherently not funny, my job is to make them not do the joke. Because, Absolutely. Uh, everything. So, what would your advice be? You know, uh, is be understand yourself enough so you 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 know who you are yes i think so i mean it was, I, I was just thinking there when you you know somebody who was inherently one of the unfunniest people but made one of the great jokes of all time which was the lady's not returning you turn if you want to you know well, it was the other way around wasn't it you turn yeah. if you want to the lady's not returning yeah. great moment and she delivered it 
spot on. And she could be devastatingly funny, although she hadn't a single funny bone in her body, but because she was very um, clever with her words. Um, and I'll never forget her that last time she did PMQ. Um, I rushed home to watch it because it was all so exciting. We were getting rid of her at last. And, and um, uh, as somebody said, would she be interested in being the governor uh, 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 of something about the Bank of England? And Dennis Skinner, who was very funny, said, she'll be the governor. Um, uh, and she said, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind. And she had such delight in her eyes. It was terribly funny. I thought, oh, all right, I think we'll, we'll miss you a bit. <laughs> mm. uh, you know, there were moments that she could understand. So, yes, of course, even supremely serious, unfunny people can see moments for humour. So it's it's about but, understanding your limitations and working within them, is it? Yes, and, and trusting your joke writers. Oh, so trusting somebody to go, if you say this in exactly this order with this yes. beat in between, it'll because work. that line was that, you know, the lady's not for turning was written for her. She, she, she really doubted it, but they went, yeah, you do. And it's one of her most memorable moments. Well, you see, the the interesting thing, and we're talking about Margaret Thatcher, the, the interesting thing for me, I, I thought she had an instinct of knowing what she didn't have and working on it. Because if you remember, she worked with the RADA coach to uh, lower, was she go down two or three semitones yes. in, in the pitch yeah. of her voice? Mm. And so therefore, I think that she will have gone to somebody and said, I need to be funny, I need a joke, how do I make it work? Without without doubt, yes, and, and I think that was part of, um, I mean, I think, you know, they do try to train you in, in public life, if you go into public life, don't they? They have teams of people who are ready there, you know, to train you in deportment and, and how to put a speech across, how to read from a text, and how to make jokes as well. And you, you know, she would, she was, I think, um, a, a clever woman for, for um, well, she, of course, she was a very clever woman, but she, but she was willing to learn and willing to school herself. Which, which I think feeds into, you can, you know, with a, a modicum of, of, of a, a funny bone or a tiny little bit of a funny bone, you can actually build on that to an extent if you're smart. But Paul, are you saying um, people can be funny around a dinner table or they can be funny in their speeches or in holding a meeting? Because what you do is help people to communicate with humour in business. I still think, you know, that come the moment when they're, they're, they're at, you know, at a dinner party, they can still be unutterable bores. <laughs> yes, I, know. I think that, but that's not my job to get them through the dinner party, to be honest no, with you. Here's a joke you can tell at a dinner party. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, actually, I'll, what I'll, I'll, I'll just get them to put one of your songs on, on, on the gramophone I'll and stand you. back and, in, and, and bask in the glow. <laughs> Um, what would the world be like without humour? Intolerable. Intolerable. You, you think that it, it would just be a, a terrible place? Yes. It would be appalling. I mean, I'll just give you a little example, um, uh, which has happened lately. Um, one of my greatest friends has just died. Uh, David Johnson, legend of Edinburgh, legendary producer, legendary bon viveur, giant personality. And he was, of course, well known at Edinburgh. And um, the funniest things that somebody said to me yesterday was, you know, because he was taking, he was taking a while to die. And we were all, um, you know, communicating in these sort of terrible solitary vigils. And, um, uh, some uh, John, his his uh, business partner, said to a great friend, he said, "It's like Edinburgh. It's just it's just like Edinburgh." Uh, or David always he, he he said, "If I'm still here in Edinburgh on Monday, shoot me." And there he'd be on it a Monday in Edinburgh, holding court and going out to dinner to Barnapoli, um, you know. And that made us all cry laughing, even though 
it's in terribly sad circumstances. You've got to be able to leaven life. It's the yeast of life. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I, I made, when my father died, uh, we went to Hungary for his memorial service. My father was a Hungarian refugee and we went back and I walked into a very sad room where my brother who lives in Hungary and his wife and the children were and I instinctively did something that was 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 could be conceived in bad taste because he died before his 90th birthday and we were going to have a big party. And I went typical bastard stopped us from having a party. And, you know, and there was shock in the room and the shock led to laughter, which yes. broke the atmosphere. And we do need that um, yeah. without doubt. Yeah, I, I don't know if you remember John Cleese's memorial speech for Graham Chapman. I thought that was a great example of it, whereby... No, but I did, uh, I did hear his speech for Barry Took, which was very funny. His oh. memorial speech for Barry, because I, I sang at Barry Took's <laughs> memorial. Oh, right. Well, and it, it is about lightening the, the atmosphere at that. And, you know, I know it's a... <laughs> It's something that everybody says, but it's what they would have wanted. And, if, you know, you'd, you'd want people to miss you, but you'd also want people to remember you in a fond way and laugh with you as well, yeah. which I think is important. Do you find yourself funny? No. No, not at all? No. Not in the slightest bit funny. No, I, no, I take myself far too seriously. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite a boring person. Uh, well, I don't think so. I think our listeners will, will uh, <laughs> think I completely the opposite. Rigid. You bore yourself rigid? Yeah. But is that, the, well then, is that where, because you're giving everything on, on stage and you're putting everything into the work? I mean... I don't know, really. No. I don't find myself funny, no. I find myself absurd. Oh. <laughs> I find the human condition absolutely absurd. I'm very disappointed in myself. Really? Is that your driver? What is that what drives you uh, forward all the time? Ooh, I don't know what my driver is. No, I think I don't know. What, I don't know what my driver is. And I've never, never sought to find out, really, because I think... I'm not sure that finding out is helpful. I mean, I, I suppose I, I had a quite an unhappy childhood. I think that's my driver. And, but I mean, the, the drive for, I mean, for performance, for perfection in songs, for uh, getting a laugh. I mean, wow. Well, that's just that the pleasure of the work. Okay, but that so that's I a driver. In... I love tinkering with uh, with it for for a long time, and and tinkering with with the, with the rhymes and saying and and um, of course my co writer uh, Adele Anderson is as nitpicky as me, which drives us both completely. <laughs> um, and she'll say, I think it should be of, not by. There, <gasps> we've recorded by. We have to go back. <gasps> um, you know, so um, we do we. We are terribly, we're, we're fussy people, but that's, um, that's no bad thing to be fussy in your work. No, but I'm intrigued that you, you don't actually find yourself funny. You, you, there's no level, you, you understand you are a, funny. Okay, when I'm writing a song, um, I know I can come up with funny stuff. And then, but it's the stuff I find funny, not me I find funny. Oh. But 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 then you are a large part of making it funny. Oh yes, I mean, I mean when we wrote the dogging song, I don't think we ever, we ever laughed so much in our lives, um, and really? just the, the the kind of huge kind of gut painful laugh of <laughs> uh, you know uh, of findings of uh, Adele saying Adele wrote uh, wrote I would say two thirds of that song. Um, with every, you know, it's always ascribed to me, but it's not, it's Adele, it's two thirds. I just kept kind of pushing her. I'm, what I'm very good at is a very good driver of, I, I can say, no, that's not right, but there's something in that. So I'm a good editor. And, and um, I'm, 
credited with far too much of the material, uh, but I'm a much better editor than the, uh, than uh, any of the people I've written with. Um, I'm, you know, that's that's my skill, is 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 is, is seeing the overall uh, picture of, of what we're trying to write. So the dogging song, I'd say Adele wrote between two thirds and three quarters of it. However, um, then I will come up with the killer line. Uh, for that said, for you, know, she said, um, um, by now something we were thrilled to bits, and I said, I love to feel a copper's truncheon in between my tits. Yeah. She just, you know, <laughs> then we just laughed about 20 minutes. <laughs> That's worth the entrance fee alone, to be honest yeah. with you. That line, but you know, thing, and and for our listeners who haven't uh, heard the dogging song, um, become one of tens of millions who uh, log on to YouTube and uh, and see it because it is uh, one of the classic funny songs of all time. Yeah. And I say that as somebody who has been sort of in co the comedy song business for many, many years. And it is, it's, you know, it's hard I, to I, it's, You know, when, uh, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite um, uh, there are moments when I never want to sing it again. It's sort of like a ball and chain because I've written so much better stuff, <laughs> more complex or more interesting things. No, it's just a piece of doggerel, but it's unassailable. It's an unassailably funny song. And um, people write to me and say, you know, now that COVID struck, you know, dogging is one of the few things we can do open air. How about an extra verse? I wrote, I always write back and say, no, do not tamper with perfection. It's no. perfect. I'm, you know, I can be quite arrogant about things. You know, I think it's a perfect song. Perfect piece of shit, but it's perfect. No, no, but it, it is perfection. It, it is. You don't want to mess with it, really. It's the funniest song I've ever come across. <laughs> Well, yeah, 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 I, kind of funny. yeah I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think it helps, though, that, you know, that it's been sung by a woman of 60 plus. Uh, well, um, yes. Well, uh, would you with a, with a, I, I know I've got a sort of posh voice um, and I've never tried to change that. Although it was very fashionable when I was young, it, makes well, it, uh, really it does, and it won't make gets funnier with time, of course. And and actually, I think that you know, you have the the classic talent of being able to write with Adele, write these songs, but also very few people can can bring that laugh home, which is that stagecraft which uh, I think is, you know, because a lot of the laughs are coming from what you uh, described as gurning earlier on, which I don't think, I think you're laughing it in or you're doing the no nodding it in, uh, the thing. And I well, think that's- Well, as an actress, so it's the same every time. I'm terribly precise about everything. Yeah, so, but uh, very, very few actors can do comedy successfully, I always find. I always find that, you know, there is that line where, you know, the tragedy is easy and comedy is difficult. How do you feel about that? It depends. Uh, I, uh, I've done plays in which I've been very bad. I, did, I played the nurse in Romeo and Juliet. I was, I was fucking terrible. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I think, you know, I think Shakespeare's really difficult, would be, is really difficult for me. To, I just don't, I just don't cleave to the language at all. You know, you need a lightness of touch and you need, you need the right actors. You need the right actors for tragedy and you need the right actors for drama, something in between, you know, um, which can be funny, uh, but, but not necessarily hilarious. Is it um, important to be able to laugh at yourself? Yes, yes. That's why I say I don't find myself funny. I find myself absurd. So I, I mean, in in general, because we people are going to take away things from this. Why is it so important to be able to laugh at yourself? It makes you human, a human, humane as well. Um, if you if you can't um, laugh at yourself then you're never going to see the flaws. It's the flaws that are funny. The good bits aren't funny, particularly. The good bits are great bits you need to cherish, look after. But the flaws are what makes you or a humane, um, it makes you a human being. And um, if we just, if we only ever laugh at other people, then that's rather cruel. 
isn't it? Yes, and I think, uh, well, the, being able to laugh at yourself humanizes you in the eyes of other people. You become sort of, uh, you don't become uh, somebody on a pedestal, you become somebody at their level. Yes, I see, I see one thing where, where you're getting at is do, when you ask, do I find myself funny? Um, there are two ways to answer that. Am I amused by myself? Uh, do I find myself um, sort of witty and, and uh, you know, I, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Noel Coward. I don't drop witticisms. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not amusing like that. I can be good fun to be with, I know that. Um, uh, but uh, I can also be a dead bore to be with. Um, and uh, But what I do find is I do find myself absurd to the point of amusement. I'm amused by my absurdities, which is slightly different. Do you think people laugh enough in their workplace? Now, we were, worked in show business for years, so there is a lot of laughter, but most people um, work in offices and sort of, you know, shops and places. Do you think there's... It, it should be mandated more, that there should be more chances to laugh. Yes, I do. I think, uh, I think laughter is a great lubricant. Um, and um, I worked um, in, for many years because I didn't enter showbiz till I was 26. And I worked um, in, in an advertising agency in various um, uh, lawyers' offices and things like that um, as in secretarial capacity. And I worked in bars and things of course, bars, you can have a joke with people. But, it, but you know, in offices, it's very dull. And, and I, I, I remember fleeing um, the headquarters of William Hill because this guy kept coming, uh, coming in and going, well, <laughs> roll on Friday, <laughs> roll on Friday, eh? <laughs> and well, he'd said it all Monday, and by Tuesday morning, I'd had enough, and I just walked out and said, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't face it because if, if that's if you're there all week saying roll on Friday, that's misery. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, you know if you can look forward to working, that you can have a laugh with people, get down to your work. Um, I remember uh, I, I was working in a company making bl that made blinds, and um, I, I had such a good laugh with the women in the offices there because I was typing the invoices. And I'm a very fast typer. Um, and I would do three quarters of an hour, really hard, just ferocious typing. And then I'd go, right, I'm taking a quarter of an hour off because I'd start getting things wrong. And I'd crack jokes and things like, we'd have a bit of a laugh around the office and things like that. And then they would be hugely amused because they would go, right, I'm going, I'm going to set an invoice every 70 seconds. <laughs> But they would be in, they would be in, in knots at this sort of obsessive, you know, thing. But I was partly doing it because it was a very dull job and it made light in the office uh, and it was fun. Yeah, well, part of the whole humorology um, movement, uh, as I like to call it now, is about getting more laughter into the workplace because I do think that it actually... Uh, helps the bottom line. If people are happier, they're going to be more productive, don't you think? Absolutely. Um, and <laughs> um, nobody ever typed more invoices than me, but I did actually take quarter of an hour every hour off to go. <sighs> and uh, as a result, my, my, my productivity was much be better than Elaine's, who I was re re replacing. <laughs> well, OK, now well, let, let's put your advertising hat back on in your business case. If you had to make a business case for humour, what would you include? Why is it going to be that much better for business? If you make your surroundings and your workspace pleasant, people will work better. Simple as that. As simple as that. And your return on investment is the fact that there is more productivity, essentially. Yes. And, and, and actually, it makes it um, cheerier for, for the, you know, the customer. Uh, I've, I'm aware that, you know, as I get older, I could be turned into one of those women who says, oh, nice day out. Oh, isn't it? What a shame about the weather. Oh, etc. Um, but I always test my... Um, if I go through the till, I try and have a tiny bit of conversation with who is on the, on the till so that 
there is a little human exchange. And because I'm now, uh, uh, you know, at, at this sort of unembarrassable age of 68, uh, I don't mind about doing that. I mean, I wouldn't have done it when I was 30, but I, I think actually um, you should do it at every age. You should uh, try to communicate. Whenever I go into the bank, and uh, they, I used to get money out. They'd say, how do you want it? You know, and as you still do it. You say, I want to uh, change it all into euros. They say, how do you want it? And I say, always say doubled. <laughs> It's so, I mean, it's, I, I, I don't find it funny anymore, but I just go doubled. <laughs> they look up and they go, oh, <laughs> sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> um, you know, and it's, you, you just think, oh, God, it must be dismal working here. You know, because actually, um, it's, it's, it's a gentle joke. It's not, it's not going to, you know, nobody's going to take, take, take me up on it. You know, no, nobody's going to try and steal it. But... You know, it's it's an effort to sort of make a a moment of humour between me and the teller, and the te it's, then sometimes the teller goes, "Oh, oh, I wish I could." <laughs> to be nice. Yes. Well, yes. but but what you're doing is you're you're bringing a little bit of light into yes. their world, aren't oh, you? How would you like it? Could you put it on the three <laughs> thirty? <laughs> that can't melt, please. <laughs> When it also delivering it with a straight face makes it so much funnier as well, doesn't it? it, it, it I, I don't know if it does. I don't, <laughs> very, very rarely make people laugh. But it's really, it's partly to sort of, um, to like my day as well. well. Well, but that's what it does, doesn't it? It's a it's a symbiotic process. Is yeah. that if you if you bring something into somebody else's day, and you know, as a psychologist, what we what we say is if you want anybody to go into any state, you have to go into that state first, and so therefore, by being light and everything, you take that person into that world with you. Have you ever taken a joke too far? Cross the line. Yeah, we've got we've got uh, lines wrong in song. Yeah, and we've had to. Oh, oh, let's change that tonight. So, have you ever gotten yourself out of trouble by using humour? No, because you see, well, I was very, I was a very funny, lively, scatty teenager, and and it, and I found it didn't work with my teachers. <laughs> That's good. In business, is it survival of the fittest or survival of the funniest? Fittest. Really? You think that it's as clear as that? Yeah. Yes, I do. Um, I, uh, I, unfortunately, I, I, I do subscribe to the idea that a lot of the most successful business people are somewhat emotionally detached not all of them by any means but you think of someone like um philip green mm. the emotional detachment that says i can give all this money to my wife and oh dear now the business is gone and all the, oh dear how many thousand jobs one of our chief brexiteers a very charming and um, eloquent man um but can be one of the chief Brexiteers and take vast subsidies from the EU for his vast farms um, and um, move quite a bit of his operation to Singapore. How does somebody not see that that's massively unfunny and massively detached from being a good human? You think that actually... Uh, a level, and I'm not describing these two people as uh, psychopaths, but a level of psychopathy yes. um, actually works better in business than the, the level of humour. Because it's allowed. Yeah. Because, you know, we don't have the kind of uh, legal framework that st stops it from happening. I don't know how you frame it, but uh, name me a well-known hello. I mean, Alan Sugar has a very good sense of humour, I think. I think you find him very dry and very droll. And I know he's an absolute tough businessman. Um, my, my partner came across him quite a lot in the, in the city. He, you know, says, oh, he's a very tough businessman, but he's quite clearly got a wonderful sense of humour. So it can work. I'm slightly nervous about the idea that you put fittest against funniest, because I don't think it's either or. 
I don't think you need to be funny and I don't think you necessarily need to be fit. You just need to be there at the right moment sometimes. Dilly, we've come to the part of the show, which uh, the end part of the show, which is called Quick Fire Questions, which um, one day we'll have a, a jingle for, I promise you, but maybe you could write one. <laughs> <laughs> so Quick Fire Questions. Who's the funniest person that you've met then? John Diamond. Really? The, the, the author and journalist on John Diamond? Yeah. Yes. I, I, I almost lost my lunch laughing at, at John Diamond. It was just wonderfully funny. What book makes you laugh? Diary of a Nobody okay. uh, by George Wheaton Grossmith, equal to The Wimbledon Poisoner by Nigel Williams. Oh, okay. Two for the price of one. Yeah. What what film makes you laugh? Groundhog Day. What film makes you laugh? Groundhog Day. What film? No. <laughs> See, we couldn't resist it, could we? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> okay, slightly, what word makes you laugh? Discombobulate. Oh, lovely word. Lovely word. And sometimes, uh, uh, as an alternative, discombobulate. Oh, I was really discombobulated. Oh, I love the American use of language. Oh yeah, the the way they mangle it. No, in a no good way. Words. No old-fashioned words uh, like discombobulate. Okay. Word. Okay, I will be looking that up. Um, this slightly serious because I I know um, because of your eco blog that this is very. Um, dear to your heart, but what's not funny? Plastic. Yeah. And uh, by the way, everybody should uh, read Dilly's blog, sh Shit You Don't Need, because then you'll see. Uh, and uh, you've been saying it for a long time and uh, it's, it's all coming true, um, unfortunately. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? Clever. Really? Yeah. Well, I would argue that you have to be clever to be funny. So would you agree with that? No, I know some people who aren't hugely bright who are just wonderfully funny. Oh, so, do, oh, okay. Yeah. They're just funny in, in a different way. So you describe the ways they're funny then. Well, I don't think Cannon and Ball were terribly funny, terribly clever, but they were funny, you know, not for me. Yeah. And it didn't make me laugh particularly. Um, but, you, or Jimmy Cricket, I don't think of him as having a, you know, he's, he's not Dara O'Brien, but he's just, he's adorably funny. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I would sort of argue that actually that they probably are very bright to do those characters and get that. Oh, they have a, they have a, a bright, but, you know, I mean, Dara O'Brien is clever. Yeah, that's true. Sandy talks to is clever. That's Stephen true. Fry, clever. They've got brains the size of Europe. <laughs> you know, it's a, there's a different breed out there now, uh, you know, from what there was when we were growing up. Well, final question. Um, desert Island gags. You've got one gag that you can take to a desert island with you. What is it? It's a joke. Do I have to tell it? Yes. <laughs> Mrs. McTavish and Mrs. Taylor are out at tea and they're having tea in Jenner's, which is a very, very respectable department store in Edinburgh, as I'm sure you remember. Having tea. Uh, Mrs. McTavish says, uh, she says oh, those scones were delicious, weren't they? Oh, they were, they were, Mrs. McTavish. Uh, Mrs. Taylor, Mrs. Taylor, the scones were lovely, the lovely fresh cream and jam. And, oh, look, should we be wee devils and have a cake? Oh, <laughs> oh you're very naughty, but why not, eh? <laughs> So it's a Thursday after all. So Betty, Betty, would you bring over the cake trolley, please? She said, Betty brings over the cake. So I said, oh, the cakes look lovely. They do. And Betty, are they fresh cream or are they cream batissier or the fresh cream, ma'am, fresh cream? And, uh, well, you tell me, Betty, is that a cake or a meringue? No, you're no rang, it's a cake. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, well, that's one for all our Scottish listeners around the world. That's brilliant. You've been a wonderful guest and wonderful inspiration. Keep writing those beautiful and hilarious songs. Dilly Keen, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you very much for asking me. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.